Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Last month, this program reported on disturbing developments inside the troubled independent inquiry into child sexual abuse. The inquiry's most senior lawyer was alleged to have sexually assaulted a colleague but was allowed to resign with no investigation. The senior lawyer robustly denied the allegation and the inquiry insisted it had not received any complaint about such an incident. But tonight, a committee of MPs has sharply criticised the inquiry, saying its response to the disclosure of the alleged sexual assault as well as allegations of bullying was inadequate. It would be a troubling charge for any organisation, but it is especially so for one that was meant to be investigating just such failings in other organisations. So can it now rebuild its credibility? Here's Jake Morris. Its job is to shine light into dark corners of our past and present. But tonight, the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse was accused by MPs of failing to properly investigate a claim of sexual assault under its own roof. Tonight, Newsnight can reveal that the inquiry faces its potentially most challenging criticism yet. It was an allegation broadcast by Newsnight four weeks ago. Tonight, the Home Affairs Select Committee warned the inquiry's failure to properly investigate itself was so serious that it threatened its ability to judge others. We do not believe that ICSA has taken seriously enough its responsibility to pursue allegations of bullying or disclosures of sexual assault within the inquiry. One of the inquiry's key purposes is to assess other organisations' procedures for dealing with disclosures of sexual assault or abuses of power, an institutional reluctance to confront difficult issues that might jeopardise their reputation. We therefore believe that it is extremely important that the inquiry can show that it treats these issues with appropriate rigour when they affect ICSA itself. Tonight, Inquiry Chair Professor Alexis Jay announced an independent review. She said, While I am confident that our safeguarding and dignity at work procedures are robust, I recognise the impact of recent speculation and commentary about them. As a result, the inquiry will invite an external senior legal figure to review some of the issues raised in the committee's report. I think there has been a lack of transparency and for an inquiry that at its heart is all about uncovering conspiracies of silence and things being swept under the carpet and by public bodies not properly investigating serious child sex um, abuse. It's really vital that the inquiry itself is as upfront and transparent uh, as it can be. And so these stories about who did what to whom and when and how within the uh, inquiry uh, are not absolutely strategic to the work of the inquiry itself, but are seriously damaging in the way they've been gaining the headlines and overhanging the work of that, that inquiry. It's a very serious and unhelpful distraction. Newsnight's report in October revealed the inquiry had dropped an investigation into its most senior lawyer, Ben Emerson. This despite being made aware of a claim of sexual assault against him, a claim Mr Emerson strongly denies. In his Mr Emerson resigned, but it was agreed he would carry on working for the inquiry for a further two months. When MPs asked, answers didn't come. Why was Mr Emerson suspended? I cannot discuss anything to do with Mr Emerson's circumstances. Of all the criticism of the inquiry today, arguably the most acidic came in a letter sent to the MPs by the man who, until last December, had been Ben Emerson's deputy. Hugh Davis QC is an expert in safeguarding. He had never said anything publicly about the inquiry, and the inquiry had told him not to engage with the MPs. Mr Davies ignored them, and in loyally language, he accused the inquiry of a cover-up. There is an impression that rather than investigating the disclosures to meet these safeguarding objectives, ICSA has reached a de facto compromise agreement with the subject of the disclosures and ended the investigation. 
There is no evidence of consideration having been given to either one, the possibility of recurrence within the inquiry, or two, what investigation was required, even if the person making disclosure did not wish to pursue a formal complaint as to risk future employees who may work with the subject of complaint in the future, whether at ICSA or elsewhere. You can see how an organisation will say, look, things happen on our premises, if the two individuals concerned are not going to make a complaint, it's not going to go any further. But on the other hand, an organisation has these days an obligation to provide safe and appropriate working conditions. It can't condone misbehaviour on its premises. It should at least look into what's happened to see whether it's behaving as it needs to, to safeguard the concerns of people who work there. It can't just cover the whole thing up because there hasn't been a formal complaint. MPs agreed. There is a risk to the inquiry's authority if there is a perception of a cover-up over allegations of abuse. Their lack of preparedness to account for some of the things that have gone on and slightly hiding behind um, HR um, uh, excuses for this is an internal matter we all deal with, um, I'm afraid aren't good enough. And because of the publicity surrounding um, this, they do need to account for what has, has, has gone on. The criticism didn't end there. The inquiry accused of not yet doing enough to support the abused. We regard ICSA's slow progress to date in engaging directly with survivors as being a significant weakness in its work. We want to see as an inquiry. We don't want it to stop. We want it to succeed, but we want it to be right. It's important to us because it's about us. It's supposed to be about what happened to us. If you want our faith and confidence, all you have to do is be straight and transparent with us and do what you say you're going to do. So far, you really haven't done that. Also released tonight letters between senior figures on the inquiry and the Home Affairs Select Committee. Those letters show an inquiry fighting for its independence, resentful of elements of the scrutiny MPs have put them under. But tonight's report has prompted a personal apology from the chair of the inquiry to victims and survivors of abuse. It's an apology for the anxiety caused by recent events. The inquiry is battling to retain the support of survivors of abuse. Bitter experience means many of them fear institutions will always tend to sweep embarrassing issues under the carpet. That is why how the inquiry handled their own matters so much. Jake Morris, well, we did ask for a representative from the inquiry and indeed from the Home Office, but no one was available. The chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee is the Labour MP Yvette Cooper. I'll be speaking to her first. And Peter Knotts QC uh, from three, three Hare Court Chambers worked as junior counsel on the Hutton Inquiry. Yvette Cooper, first of all, what shocked you the most? I think it was the complete lack of transparency and uh, both about the, uh, how they had handled allegations of bullying and of uh, dis sexual assault disclosures, but also more widely the, the resistance to any form of scrutiny. And look, they are an independent inquiry and their work is vital I and mean, we want this inquiry to be effective. But in order to do so, given all of the problems that they've had, there has to be much more transparency about what's gone wrong. Well, I want to talk about that in a minute, but just looking at this mm. litany, uh, two chairs so far, uh, lead counsel, junior counsel, in all seven lawyers gone or going, the biggest survivor group has pulled out. And today, as you said, defensive and slow, not responding mm. to these inquiries, how much worse could it actually get? Well, I think that's the issue that they need to deal with and they need to address to get it back on track. And we set out some specific things that they need mm -hmm. to do as well as the more general things that they need to do in order to deal with this. Otherwise, they won't be able to build the confidence that people need. Well, what about the position of the chair, mm -hmm. Alexis G? Do you know, I think this has all got become too much focused on have we, is it, can we solve everything by just changing chairs each time? This is now the fourth chair mm. and, you know, we've lost, you know, chairs along the way. If you just think that this can be solved by just changing the chairs, I think this is missing the point. And so that's why we didn't look specifically at, yeah. at the issue of the chair. We looked at the wider issues around the inquiry, around the way that it's got this culture of defensiveness that it's built up and what are the things that it needs to do to turn it round. But that, the, the question of Alexis J is a question of leadership. And again, it's striking that after our report, when we approached the inquiry, 
uh, about these allegations of bullying and sexual assault. You know, the, 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 what they said was flat out, no complaint, not even disclosure. And actually, as far as they were concerned, they said they claimed knew nothing about it. Well, and you know, actually, the most probably the most disturbing thing of all was not actually what they said formally. It was the uh, report of the unattributed report to an unattributed ICSA source, their inquiry source, reported in the newspaper, being very, very dismissive of the whole thing. So, and what we said they should have just done more to distance themselves yeah. from that unattributed but source and that unattributed briefing as well. Do you think, though, the inquiry was straight with the select committee and indeed? the public about Ben Emerson's departure? Well, the truth is we don't know what the circumstances were. And actually, in the end, it's not our position as the committee to go into the detailed allegations and, and what exactly happened. But we have to hold that it should, up to the light. Yes, but you? that should be done, I think, by somebody else. Right? I think it's and rather it's going than a to committee. Be done and, by somebody exactly. Else. So we called for uh, some an external person to come in and to look at this case because that could provide more transparency that they have actually followed this followed procedures properly, that they have actually but, taken seriously their responsibility to deal with allegations of bullying. But do you think that's going to be enough? You know, you hear from Shai Keenan, you know, the big, the, some of the big, big survivor groups are simply not having anything to do with this inquiry just now until this is sorted out. And that is the responsibility on the inquiry to deal with this now. So, but I think it's it's not just the the inquiry into the, the bullying allegations. You cannot have unresolved bullying yeah. allegations in an institution that has not a responsibility one that's looking at exactly, exactly to deal with and to I mean, it is, it, it, it is actually, it's kind of Orwellian, actually. And I wonder if, in the end, it's going to be possible to put this back together again and get the trust of people again. Well, and who's going to scrutinise it? In, and that's an interesting, another interesting point because obviously the inquiry has to be independent. It was set up to be independent as part of its, you know, establishing its credibility. And you wouldn't expect people to, to question the conclusions it comes to or the truth finding it does. But there has to be some scrutiny of its approach, of, uh, of the processes and, and the approach it takes, particularly when so much has gone wrong. And that's the role that and we have tried to play. Money. Exactly, is to, to hold it to account in a way that doesn't challenge the independence of the content of their work and the, scrutiny and the work that they have to do to investigate, but does say, look, you've still got to be accountable to someone. Do you want to see uh, the inquiry split into a judicial inquiry and a social services investigation? I think that is one option because the, the, the inquiry is so broad in scope. I think that's been one of its challenges for each of the four chairs has been a challenge as to how to, to focus it most effectively. And we've come across this unresolved tension between those who want a judicial approach to past events, with to historic judge. events, not necessarily with a judge, but, it, but with someone who ha can approach that forensic, get to the truth mm -hmm. approach. It could be a judge, could be somebody else, or, and separately, a thematic approach to child protection policies today, where we know there are still considerable failures. Those are two different kinds of approaches to two different sorts of things. And I think there's been a, a tension and people worried that one is going to dominate the other, that they're not actually mm. going to get the, to the truth. Yeah. And, and we have to be absolutely clear about this. Who this is awful for is the survivors. Exactly. Of and that's who this in the end has got to be for, to deal with the historic, the, the cover-ups that have never been challenged and the terrible abuse that still scars people today. Yvette Cooper, thank you very much. Indeed. Peter Knox, um, turning to you, you are a very experienced lawyer. You were involved in the Hutton inquiry into the death of David Kelly, a big controversial inquiry. Why do you think this inquiry has run into so much trouble? Well, I think there are two main problems. The first, the remit is impossibly wide. Uh, a lawyer looks at that remit and thinks, you must be joking. Mm -hmm. It's to inquire into uh, whether state institutions and non-state institutions have complied with their duty of care to mm -hmm. children under their protection. Without limit in time, it could go back 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. Uh, the other problem is there's no time limit within which the report has to be made. If you give a wide remit, but a time limit, let's say, come back within a year, then the people con conducting the inquiry can say, well, we can only, as it were, carry out this wide remit within a certain narrow sphere. The impression one has is it's a very wide sphere which they've been asked to look into, and that's caused a lot of problems subsequently. And so far, we're losing or have lost seven lawyers on that <coughs> inquiry. Why well, is that? Uh, well, uh, we haven't been told the exact reasons. That's part of the problem. But uh, all I can say is, as a lawyer, it is virtually inconceivable that lawyers would resign from an inquiry. Really? Um, I, I think one thing which is very striking is that uh, there is no provision in the Inquiries Act 
to work out what happens when you have this position. The reason for that is it just doesn't happen normally. And, and that's the problem which obviously the Home Affairs Committee came across. Everyone effectively clammed up and said, I'm sorry, I can't tell you anymore. Mm -hmm. But on the question of, uh, this is what lawyers are meant to do, isn't it? I mean, uncover injustice. And so therefore this is actually, it's, it, it's a very big job for lawyers. They presumably don't walk away lightly because in fact, it's the very people they're trying to help that, that are inevitably let down. Well, I think once you take on a brief, you do it. That's mm -hmm. that. Um, you may not want to take on a brief, and if, you're, if you have reasons for not doing so, you can. But uh, a case like this, I could understand why someone might say, I can't commit five years of my life to doing it. But I think once you have, then you're duty-bound to carry on, and it takes the most serious circumstances to drop out. Do you think it's fixable? What do you think could be done? Well, or not? I don't know, but my guess would be the sensible way forward would be to terminate this inquiry and to start a new one on a narrower basis with a time limit within which the report has to be made. And I think I'm not the only lawyer who says that. I've seen other people suggesting that too. Thank you both very much indeed.